Frank, you mentioned send them back. Uh, they, usually, they usually start with us. We, we don't get a lot back from you guys. Where, where, where should we, as, you know, as practicing endocrinologists that are taking care of this, where do you want to get involved in these patients? You know, not the yeah. rapidly ones from the beginning, the ones that are growing more slowly over time. Where, where do you want to become part of the team or part of the process? Right. You know, like I say, you know, send it back. It's interesting. I live in Michigan. And so our catchment area is like the entire state of Michigan. And so one of my colleagues, your colleagues, Megan Hamer, published yeah. this very brilliant paper in JAMA saying that people get RAI kind of depending where they live. Yeah, without a doubt. <laughs> and what doses they get. And it's just it's very fascinating. So people will come to us and sometimes it's very confusing. <laughs> so that's why I said, well, I'll send you back because I definitely want your opinion regarding, you know, like those middle ground cases such as Marsh is describing. But what's interesting, I prefer, and I think Marsha and Eric probably does as well, to see them when they become refractory earlier than later. Um, what I find sometimes is the outside of Michigan endocrinologists will hang on to the patients a little longer, managing their TSH, they're suppressing it, which is great. By the time they come to me, they've already developed those symptoms, that, that shortness of breath or that extensive bone pain that should have been radiated, now their pelvis is half eaten or whatnot. Mm -hmm. Those people should be seen earlier. So I per personally am on a big movement <laughs> to have these patients you know, seen earlier when we really are kind of on that cusp of saying they're refractory to iodine or we know they're refractory. Yeah. yeah, and even the asymptomatic patients, there are a Correct. lot of things we do before patients go on kinase inhibitors that we can help them have a better outcome. If we can get them to a gym and start doing weightlifting and all of right. these things, and people laugh and they're like, "You really do that?" And I'm like, "80-year-old ladies, I'm sending to That's the gym." What we yeah. do and too. and the and it gym. makes a huge difference. But there's a lot of education that we can be doing during that period, what we would call active surveillance, where we're still deciding when they're going to need it. We can do a lot of inter interventions and a lot of education. So I agree. The sooner I get them the better. I don't have to see them that often, but I want to at least have my eyes on them at least once or twice a year. Yeah, um, talk before talk then. about that, Eric, because we, we share a lot of patients together and we tend to cross over for a year or two. And it seems like at first you see them less frequently, I see them more frequently, and then that begins to shift as they begin. Talk, talk about how you like to do that transition between our clinic and your yeah. clinic. I mean, we, you definitely do not want to see the person just when they're ready to start treatment. Or worse, when I first started out, about two weeks before they went on hospice. <laughs> I, mean, it, it, it's, I don't do that anymore. Just for the record, you have to. No, it, 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 okay. no, it was, was always said, fun back then. Edited, please. Um, That'd be good. You've so, come a long way since then. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a lot of things. I mean, even for clinical trials that we want to get them ready for, and yeah. we want to know what are the mutations that are driving their tumor, um, because we know those are the patients, unlike the, the early ones that those mutations may play a role in investigational treatment. Um, and you know, even how often we watch them, there are certain things I think medical oncologists do without, that the endocrinologist will do without, or do other things without thinking, yeah. just like even giving contrast to a scan, something simple like that. It's almost ingrained with endocrinologists, don't, I'm not gonna give contrast, I'm already mm -hmm. doing that no contrast. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of things that we wanna watch out early so we know when they're ready right to to start treatment, we've already have a relationship relationship set up with them. They know us. They know what are the options that are going to exist at that time, um, and we've done the scans and everything at the rate that we think is appropriate for yeah. them. But a lot of the patients will begin out. Yeah, I'll, I'll do a scan every six months or every year. Um, you know, I'm, I might not, I won't see them every three months, but. It's nice to know that, like ahead of time, then at the point where, oh my God, you know, they're seeing, you know, the person saying, "I'm seeing Dr. Sherman, I'm, I'm dead." Yeah, <laughs> right. And, and that psychologically think, is very important. Right. They don't want to be like thinking, "Oh, now I'm seeing Dr. Sherman, right. my 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 days are numbered." Yeah, yeah. You really want that transition to be, you know, so that he'll like Dr. Sherman as much as he likes. Well, Nifa. that would never happen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> always like That's Dr. Tuttle better. Knife, talk. You you went through this transition, trained as a very classic endocrinologist, MD Anderson, mm -hmm. and you guys really think about thyroid cancer a lot like oncologists now. Mm -hmm. You're using some of the TKIs yourself. Um, talk about a little bit of that transition about how you had to think about thyroid cancer differently as an endocrinologist to begin thinking about some of the issues these guys are thinking about. Yeah, so, um, you know, when you're trained as an endocrinologist, you're used to treating chronic diseases, but when it comes to thyroid cancer, you've always been trained that, okay, you have your surgery, you have your radioactive iodine, you have your surgery, you have your radioactive iodine, and done. And as we cross-trained with a lot of our colleague oncologists, you, start, you, you have to think about a lot of other things in terms of what are your goals, right? Is it improving overall survival? Is it 
um, trying to decrease the recurrences that you have to go through. And then thinking about what are the adverse events or the side effects from the treatments that are available or that are out there, and how does this patient's lifestyle and comorbidities, and how is that going to interplay with the drugs? And so you had to think about a lot of different angles that you didn't necessarily think about when all you had was surgery and radioactive iodine. And I think that, you know, thinking about it in a manner that, you know, we're always thinking about the whole patient, but when it comes to systemic therapy, we got to figure out if this is the long-term living patient with a distant metastatic disease that's, that's, you know, just hanging out there or, it, you know, and, and living a great life and asymptomatic, or is it the patient whose the disease is rapidly progressing? But I agree with what all three, you know, Frank, Marsha, and Eric have all said, I think, you know, whether you are, as an endocrinologist are going to treat and think like an oncologist and treat with these tyrosine kinase inhibitors or other systemic therapies, or you're going to introduce them to the oncologist, I think getting the oncologist or, you know, those thought processes in early is very important because, you know, just as you stated, that patient is very different from the head and neck cancer patient, right? That comes in knowing, okay, if I don't do something today, I'm gonna die. This patient's like, I've been sitting around with this disease for 15 years, and now you're sending me over mm -hmm. to someone else who's gonna give me a systemic therapy. That means I'm dead. But they need that year or two to read about it. Think about clinical trials. Think about what their goals are, you know, and, and okay, I'm not gonna be cured of this. Let me get my head, you know, wrapped around that. And so I think those discussions are very important, but. You know, for us, yes, yeah, so we happen to be the endocrinologist that also treats the oncologic aspect of it, but we go through the same thought processes that we need we needed to. You know, in addition to what you were going to say about the clinical trials, I am all over clinical trials, like I think that most of you are here too. Like the RIFTO study, which is looking at, you know, how patients are progressing and when we start, you know, treatment with scans. I think that data is going to be really important mm -hmm. to have. Mm -hmm. And so I think the more we see those and, and someone seeing them regularly to reassure them and to follow them in that manner, you know, with studies such as this will be how very often. helpful. Yeah. And the last thing also is that you take your data or Dr. Schlumberger's data that says that once they are RA refractory and their disease is growing, progressive disease, their overall survival is on average two and a half to three and a half years if you're taking out the people who could have surgery. And it's really important, I think, for the community endocrinologist as well as the oncologist to understand that is a completely different patient. Mm -hmm. That is that right. patient's more like a lung cancer patient than they are like the bulk of the thyroid cancer patients. And where I think we have still a, a, a challenge in our country and, and maybe even around the world is when, when an endocrinologist sees 95% of their patients are the good patients, to really teach them that this patient deserves to have you know, early intervention and consideration because they will not be acting like those other ones. It's hard sometimes to get yeah. them to take that rose-colored glasses off.